Welcome back, AP. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to your flip classroom and our continuing discussion, Pierre. Oh my god, our continuing discussion of absolutism in France. <laughs> absolutism in France. So, like, big thing about it is, as you can tell, I have my own little Louis right here, right? Little Louis the Fourteenth, right here. Oh, he is the absolute ruler of this house. Now, going into it, though, we left off in class talking about the Fronde rebellions and the rise of Louis the Fourteenth when he was a very young child, right? The four-year-old little chunk chunk Louis the Fourteenth that is going to have a very large amount of things happen when he's a kid, right? For example, his mom is going to sign the Treaty of Westphalia, effectively ending the Thirty Years' War for France following the death of Cardinal Richelieu. You are also going to see the Fronde Rebellions, which are these really, really big rebellions that actually broke out, named after people who throw mud at carriages. That's what, like, Fronde means, right? Like, people who, like, miscreants or, like, naysayers and stuff. Now, the thing about it is, is because it was the nobles that actually convinced these rebellions to break out because they wanted to try and attack the young king while he was young and like because he would be the most susceptible right and then of course like i said he almost died apparently according to one story he faked sleeping like right beforehand but the number one thing it's going to do is it's going to demonstrate to louis that he must suppress the power of the nobility and bring them underneath his thumb right and he's going to do very 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 intensely right very, very intensely he will rule as an absolute leader right and he does it using six different methods right he has six different methods that actually demonstrate his absolutist approach to power, right? What is the Louis version of absolute power, right? How is Louis going to do this and what makes him unique, right? So number one, he's going to enhance and formalize the intendant system, right? The intendant, we can just say intendant. It's not a big deal, but like it's not intendant. Well, it is intendant, but I'm not going to mess it up the entire time. So now going into it though, he's going to enhance the intendant system left behind by Cardinal Richelieu and he's going to formalize it to create these avatars inside of all the districts without uh, throughout France to make it so he can oversee or supersede the parlements, right? and restrict the power of the nobility even further and prevent them from actually not writing his laws into action, right? Now, the next one is he's going to actually separate himself formally from the nobility, right? He's going to build himself a nice big new house, right? And that house is going to be known as the Palace of Versailles, right? The Palace of Versailles. And he will create there what you would refer to as his royal court, right? Now, the royal court thing is what we got to get to here in a second, right? But the Palace of Versailles, y'all, is an absolutely gorgeous beautiful complex, right? That if you ever in your life get a chance to go here, you should go here, right? But this right here is the Palace of Versailles, right? They held the equestrian events here for the Olympics this past summer. It's absolutely gorgeous. This is the gate that actually sits out front of it. And this right here is the front door, right? That is the front door right above the Côte du Mob and stuff like that. That thing right there is absolutely beautiful. It's a Baroque style palace. And y'all know how I feel about Baroque stuff. And as I always say, if it's not Baroque, don't fix it. <laughs> mm. <laughs> like, now look, going into it though, also, as you know, you can see the grandeur of it all, right? The Baroque nature of it all, the exuberance, the over the topness, the echelon of the moment, the gold on the mother flipping ceilings, right? So it is an absolutely beautiful place with over 700 rooms, over 1,200 pieces of furniture, some of the most precious art that Europe has ever seen is inside of there as well. And then on top of it all, there are no bathrooms, right? There are no bathrooms. There are no bathrooms inside the first. Well, there are now, right? But they've been added. When Louis was alive, there, there were no bathrooms because they didn't have indoor plumbing. So the other thing, though, is then also here's a bunch of chipmunks standing outside of the, like, what you call it, of the Palace of Versailles. This is when we actually went to Paris this past summer. And then going into it even further, this is Louis's bedroom. And as you can see, the Baroque grand architecture is going to set him apart from everyone else. That right there is the Queen's bedroom, or that's Marie Antoinette's bedroom, would be the last queen that actually slept inside that bedroom right there. And this right here, of course, is Louis's favorite room in his entire palace and where his court resided, right? Now, remember, the royal court was a really big thing, okay? So what it was, basically, is the um, nobility, sections of the nobility, he basically took the entire nobility and he chopped it up into thirds, right? And for a third of the year, one third of those nobles would live in the Palace of Versailles with him so he could keep an eye on what they were doing, right? And in the process, as the act was, I'm going to do is it's going to encourage these nobility nobles to fight for his attention.
election, right? Basically, Louis will actually restrict funding or not give in to what they want unless they actually kind of sucked up to him and actually did what he told them to, right? For example, one of the highest honors in France was helping him put on his riding boots in the morning, was helping him actually go to the bathroom or just being in there while he went to the bathroom, and then also helping him pick out his shirt every day and handing it to him and be like, oh, here you go, sire. Like, like you feeling blue or are you feeling pink today? What do you think? You know, like, now, like, so... But what ends up happening, though, is they also partied all the time, right? Louis's wife would be there, his mistresses would be there, right? And everybody hung out, particularly in this room. It was called the Hall of Mirrors, right? The Hall of Mirrors could hold 2,000 people, right? It's a massive, massive room, right? Spanned, of course, with the fantastic Baroque decorations, these chandeliers that are worth gobs and gobs of money, and these mirrors that made it look like even more people were actually inside of it. The mirrors also actually have hinges on them, and servants could come in and out of them, using them as little hideaway doors and stuff like that. Now, they weren't supposed to be seen as much as possible, but they would move throughout and actually come in and out of those little like mirror doors and stuff like that. Now, the interesting thing, though, speaking of being a part of this royal court, you know, I was a part of it there for a hot second with the best chaperones that you ever met with Mr. Giardina and Miss Comento and Miss Ryan Miller and me. That's us standing in the Hall of Mirrors, an absolute blast. This right here is the exterior of it. That is Louis' backyard. That is the palace grounds and the gardens. And this right here, of course, is his famous ballet theater. He had two theaters actually built inside of the Palace of Versailles, and he would force the like nobles in his royal court to come and suck up to him and watch him perform ballet, because that was his favorite thing to do, right? One of his favorite hobbies and pastimes was performing ballet, and he was a trained ballet dancer. That's why he loved wearing tights, and it's like, well, putting his legs in all of his portraits, right? He'd pop them out all the time, because he was obsessed with his own legs. He was like, look how strong my ballet dancer legs are. Now, the thing about it, though, is this is going to lead to the adoption of a nickname known as the Sun King, right? So Louis, one time when he was performing a ballet, and he was actually dressed as Apollo, right? The Greek god Apollo. He actually was, like, doing this ballet, and he could see that the lights that were at the base of the stage, right, were actually lighting up the faces of the nobility in front of him, right? And he literally started thinking to himself, I am the light for all of my people. I am the light of this country, and I am the sun of this universe, right? I am the sun king, right? And it's going to lead to this guy basically believing that he is the everything, right? No power could check him. No authority stood in his way. And his royal court, he ruled from Versailles with his centralized government, right? Remember that. Versailles was the central location of his government, right? And using his royal court that you can see right here as he accepts a sword noble that has come to visit his house. It's going to be very important going forward that we understand that this is a really, really, really large grandeur of his power. And the Palace of Versailles demonstrates it physically, right? Now, speaking of that sword noble that just showed up, right? He wanted to create more of these things called robe, no robe nobles to suppress these things called sword nobles, right? Now, some of y'all are probably immediately like, well, wait a minute, that's Jerry. Okay. What's the robe noble? What's the sword noble? Now, all of this goes back to his gr his grandfather, right? So his grandfather, Henry IV, aka Henry of Navarre, that like Cassie Nguyen just so ardently knew in class, old girl's going get a five on this AP test if she keeps that up. Now, going into it, though, you got to understand robe nobles, sword nobles, okay? So, robe nobles and sword nobles are two different types of nobility that existed in France, and they exacted power in very, very different ways, right? Now, the sword nobles, for example, are old nobility, right? They're the nobility that's been pretty much around since possibly the late Middle Ages or even possibly maybe the 14 or 1500s, but the sword nobles earned their power and their prominence and their title and their land through military action and military tradition, right? And so that because of this, they were considered very, very esteemed members of society for like centuries and centuries. And what's going to end up happening as well, though, is they can then pass their like owners or their ownership and their land title down to their descendants, right? They also were the only people allowed in France to carry a weapon openly and they could carry a sword with them, demonstrating the fact that they were a sword noble, right? Now, the thing about it, though, going into it, those are the ones that didn't like Louis the most, right? Because their families are some of the oldest and they've been around for a really long time, right? They don't like Louis at all due to the fact that he represents their loss in power, right? Because there for a long time, the sword nobles occupied the Parlements and they occupied other areas of the government and things like that. They occupied this thing called the Farmer's General where that was literally the tax collecting agency, right? The thing about it though is that if, as Louis's power increases, the sword nobility power must decrease. The sword nobles are also the same ones that inspired the Fronde rebellions, right? Now the thing about it though, going all the way back to Henry IV, all right, going 
all the way back to Henry of Navarre that, like I said, y'all knew about and y'all remembered from all that stuff. What you need to understand is he created this thing called the Paulette, right? And the Paulette was basically a fee that you could pay to get into the nobility, right? Now, that created a class of people known as the robe nobles, right? So the robe nobles, or the nobles of the robe, are people that purchased their way into the nobility, right? Now, these people, the robe nobility, were a little bit more dependent and a little bit more willing to play Louis' game of the royal court, right? Because if you increase the number of robe nobles, then you are increasing the number of nobility where their nobility is contingent on your power, right? So we wanted to create more of those robe nobles and use them to suppress those sword nobles, right? Another big way that, of course, Louis is going to do, this is something we've already talked about, he's going to fight a bunch of wars, right? His absolute, uh, absolutist approach to power is going to really hinge on fighting a lot of wars and trying to gain as much land as possible, right? Now, of course, the War of Spanish Succession is going to blow up in his face a little bit and demonstrate to us the balance of power in Europe, which is going to be very important. But going into the next one, he also wanted religious hegemony back, all right? That's right, we're going backwards in history, basically, because Louis XIV wanted to go back to a France that only had one faith, right? He wanted to get rid of Protestants. He wanted to get rid of the Huguenots. So he revoked the Edict of Nantes and reignited the persecution campaign against the Huguenots in France, right? Which is going to cause a metric buttload of them to immigrate, right? A lot of them start leaving and going to other countries. For example, like Prussia is one place they go. And a lot of them also go to the Dutch Republic to add to that golden age that they're having and stuff like that. Because not only are they taking their, like, their faith with them, they're taking away their wealth with them as well, right? Because these Huguenot, Huguenot nobles, right, are very, very wealthy people, right? But these Huguenots are going to run because he revoked that Edict of Nantes, the same document that his grandfather, Henry IV, created, right? And last but not least, if you're going to go to war a bunch, if you're going to revoke the Edict of Nantes, if you're going to build the Palace of Versailles, if you're going to have a royal court and have parties every night, you better have some money to back this whole thing up, right? So he needs to make money, all right? So what he's going to do is he's going to adopt the most, like, short-term money-making strategy you can think of, mercantilism, right? Because what you need to understand is that mercantilism is a short-term money-making solution, right? Because the idea that there's only a finite amount of material wealth out there is one false, right? Like, so because once paper money economies are actually introduced, it kind of demonstrates the fact that, you know, like material wealth is flexible. But the thing that we need to understand though, okay, going into this is that mercantilism does not set you up for success in the future, right? Because it's basing your entire economic success off of how much gold or silver you have in your reserves and a favorable balance of trade. Now, if you enact it early, the earliest enactor of it is going to see a lot of gain off of it, right? And so Louis XIV, when he started using mercantilism heavily, he is going to make a bunch of money all up front, but he's not going to leave around a lot for his descendants, right? Now, the person that guided him in this direction is a man by the name of Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Say that with me really quick. Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Say it one more time. Jean-Baptiste Colbert is actually a noble and an advisor that Louis actually hired because he, a big thing about this he wanted to hire advisors both in and outside of the nobility to create a better like kind of cabinet of like of advice and advisory boards that would actually help him rule over this stuff and Jean-Baptiste Colbert was the one that told him to adopt mercantilistic politics right or, or mercantilistic solid economics and so he wanted to create that favorable balance of trade, export more than you import, get as much gold and silver inside of your like country as you can, and also increase your colonial holdings, right? And so Jean-Baptiste Colbert will actually demonstrate that you can make a lot of money off mercantilism, but here's the biggest problem. Louis didn't leave anything behind for his descendants, right? When Louis dies in 1714, okay, he actually ruled for 70 years, but when he dies, he's not going to leave much in those, re in those coffers, he's not going to leave much in that bank account, and he actually will spiral France into debt, and that debt will then continue to roll forward and snowball out of control, eventually leading to the French Revolution in 1789, less than 100 years later, right? But that right there is where we're going to stop, because next class we're going to start talking about Russia. We only have two more slides left to go. <laughs> Hope y'all like this nice and kind of shortish flip, but I'll see y'all soon. Y'all have a good one.